I will deal firstly with the um, alleged agreed facts. If I may. Um, my lords, um, perhaps the striking um, observation that can be made about um, this allegation uh, is that it was raised for the first time in the grounds of appeal. Uh, and it was um, not suggested to the judge uh, in opening uh, when I made my closing submissions or when the judge summarized the issues from a learned friend uh, that this was not an issue for him. Uh, and uh, um, was, um, as an advocate, one has to have great sympathy for a point that's made against another advocate. Um, uh, it wasn't really in the heat of battle that the mistake was made. Um, this case was clearly uh, presented uh, in a consistent way um, from um, the moment that the first witness uh, was called right through to closing. I say from the moment the first witness was called because, of course, I didn't make an opening. Uh, and, my lords, um, it's always been our position um, that the outdoor jacuzzi was positioned in a raised area of decking, uh, as set out in paragraph 1.2 of the case summary at page 3 of the bundle. Uh, and there is a distinction uh, and we say it's an important distinction that is made in paragraph 1.3 of the case summary um, that um, measurements of the upper section of the raised decking area uh, were between 720 and 725 millimetres. And we have always understood that it is the claimant's case that she fell from the upper decking, uh, and that that is why um, th those measurements were important. The photograph that you were uh, referred to just before the short adjournment at C2 of Dr. Lemon's report is, in fact, the claimant's photograph with the circle and the X in it showing where she was. It, it's not Dr. Clement's um, recreation. Uh, and um, as uh, it's not Justice Stuart Smith um, observed, I was very careful on the evidence that I had not to put a, a positive case. Um, but I, I don't believe that anyone in court felt that we were doing other than putting the claimant um, to proof of every aspect of her accident, save um, that she did fall and she did um, feel pain in, in her abdomen. It would be remarkable if, uh, if a different view were taken. Um, and the claimants um, did not at any point raise that. Uh, even after the, uh, the judgment, when my learned friend did rise to his feet, and I think you've seen the two or three pages of transcript and the exchange uh, between my learned friend and the judge. Uh, and if I may take you to, it, it could be any photograph really, but it, um, it, um, if, if we go, um, and so the photograph, I'm trying to think which one may be better, it's two, 238. My lords, we have always viewed um, the spa of as having been set in raised decking. But, but Mr. Block, 
immediately around the pool is not decking, is it? It's not the same material as either the steps or the raised decking. It's just, it, it's mosaic or something, but it's not decking. My Lord, it's set in the millboard decking. And the, as I understand it, the spar is, uh, is dropped into uh, an area that has been created. And um, so the are you saying the black lines that we see the left hand side going to the left of the planter at the back and the right hand side going to the right of the planter at the other planter at the back? That's the mill board. No. Um, my Lord, if you look at photograph one behind tab 15. Um, sorry, can you just, just, I've taken photographs out. Can you just show ah. me which one it is? Can you just let it there are two photographs. Yes, I've got that one. Thank you. Uh, and um, there is... As far as we are concerned, the, the whole spar bath is raised from the ground. Um, there is millboard in the, in the um, area with the three lanterns on the left, uh, in the area with the uh, plants on the right, right, and I believe in the area at the back where the planters are, and I believe along the front edge of the spa bath. When you say along the front edge, the, the vertical wall? Um, the, the, the top of the vertical wall, there's an area of... I'm just wondering if there's some other photographs in the expert reports that show it more clearly. I I'm not sure that... Uh, Well, look, can I come back to that? I'll ask my instructions to see if yeah. there's a better photograph. Yeah. If, you, if you look at page 247, it's quite informative in this respect that you can see an illuminated, it looks as though the light is on within the pool. Yes. Uh, we can all agree that, as Hawkins called it, the areas to the right by the vertical wall numbered three and to the left going to what looked like glazed doors are raised uh, raised decking raised decking yes. the question that I'm asking you is uh, and we know what the steps are made of um, if, you, made of if you look at the surround right. where the illumination does not go in number, yes. number 247 so the, the, the illumination comes to an end. Yes. And then there's a, what looks like a dark line of material. Yes. That's Is that millboard. decking? That's it's millboard. millboard. Yes. Okay. But it's not raised above the. Um, it's not raised above the spar in any, to any material extent, is it? No, but it's raised above the ground, and that's what. Oh, it's raised above the ground. So is the whole spar. But no one talks about there being a raised spar. Well. Well, Lord, with, with respect, um, the case summary um, in fact 1.2 describes the outdoor jacuzzi which was positioned in a raised area of decking and accessed by a set of steps for the central handrail. Oh. Sorry, I'm 2 in the case summary. Thank you. And the, reason, the steps don't form part of the raised area of decking, they, they're, or they're not treated as forming part of the raised area. No, they're the they're mean, seen as the means of access. Means of access and ingress, yeah. yes. But 1.2 doesn't help you. That's not what 1.2 says. When it says the jacuzzi was positioned in, in a raised area of decking, that's 
consistent with it being the raised areas on to left and right. Well, my lord. You're just saying that's not how you understood it. That's not how we understood it. It's inconsistent with the way we presented the case. It's inconsistent with the way the judge and my learned friend dealt with the case. Uh, and it's inconsistent um, with the pleadings and, and the, if I may say, the, um, um, the clear um, manner in which um, we, um, in the pleadings, made it clear we're not in a position to say where she fell, how she fell. Um, that is what we mean by the circumstances. So are you saying that in 1.2 and 1.4, but not 1.3, the raised decking area constitutes everything from where the steps join the, the thing that holds the spar? Everything yes. from the point of joinder of the steps to the remainder of the thing which contains the thing containing the water yes. is raised decking? Yes. With, with, with what we were accepting uh, was that she fell from somewhere that was raised to the ground. But not on the steps? Um, we were not in a position um, to put a positive case, but we were in a position to say this is um, what she reported to Mrs. Dunbobbin. But why did you agree in 1.4 then that she fell from the raised decking area? I understand the arguments, but is that the bit that joins the steps and the raised uh, upper section? Yes and the dispute as to whether it's just where they put the rope, I understand that. But why don't you say it is agreed that after using and exiting the jacuzzi, Miss Clemens either fell from the raised decking area or fell on the steps? You don't agree that she might have fell from the steps, do you? Um, we don't agree with that, but... Um, but you don't agree with the possibility? I mean, you don't well, need we, to open We don't expand on what is said in the, in the case summary, um, but the case summary does... Um, um, refer back to the parties' respective positions as set out in the statements of case uh, in paragraph 3.1, which is perhaps not the, um, the drafter's finest hour in trying to identify issues for the court generally. Um, and if one goes to the, um, the defence, um, we would submit it's, it's pretty clear of the way at, at page 69 uh, behind tab 12 of the core bundle. Uh, and um, you were taken to uh, paragraph 7, say the step was different um, width and height. Paragraph 9, the claim is admitted. But um, as far as paragraphs seven and eight of the particular claim of concern, they describe, and that's going back um, to, to page six, um, the steps led to a raised platform stroke the edge of the jacuzzi. So there is a, a raised platform that is described Where were you? Um, in the particulars of claim, yeah. uh, page 56 of the bundle, paragraph 8, yeah. the jacuzzi was positioned above ground level, was accessed by a set of three steps, etc. The steps led to a raised platform stroke at the edge of the jacuzzi. Well, I read that as saying that where the steps go to is the edge of the jacuzzi, and there's a raised platform elsewhere. Well, but Lord, you've, you've never been any, in, you said a moment ago, you've never been any doubt that what Dr. Clements was saying was that she fell from what we have, or what Mr. Willems has been describing as the upper raised decking. Yes, we, we have um, a photograph with um, her markings on it. And where do you say you made clear that you did not accept that that was where she came from, fell from? My Lord, we, we say in, in our defence uh, in paragraph 9 that we have no knowledge of the facts and matters pleaded in paragraphs 
11 onwards of the particulars of claim, and it's those paragraphs which allege where she fell from. My problem is in 1.4, could we moved on from the pleading, the one thing that it doesn't say is that the location is in dispute, the exact circumstances leading up to and how the fall occurred are in dispute. So we know that. <coughs> it is agreed that after using and exiting the jacuzzi, Mr. Clemens fell from the raised decking area, and there is at the moment a dispute as to whether that means everything from where the steps join the jacuzzi onwards, or whether it's the upper section of the raised decking is that. But I don't see any suggestion anywhere that it could be the steps, that the location is in dispute, and it could even be falling down the steps. Well, Lord, with respect, that's obviously correct, that it, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't go on to, to say that there is a dispute as to that. But uh, it, it's made quite clear um, that the series of events leading to and including the fall are in dispute uh, in paragraph 3.1. Three point one of, of of the case summary. Okay. okay. Well, I, mean, I can't. I, we were taken to quite a number of documents. I, I don't remember any document in which uh, the raised decking deck area is identified as other than the raised bits. I mean, obviously on the left or the right, but the, the raised bit on the right. Is there any document which identifies? Uh, the raised deck area, photograph or ring or anything, as the whole thing? Um, my Lord, I'd have to look at the um, at, at the expert reports. Right. Um, well, Hawkins clearly identified the raised deck area as being the upper level, the level where she says she fell. Yes. Because could you could you just help me so that I understand your pleading? Yes. You go to page seventy-two. This is where you deal with the allegations of negligence. Yes. In B, the slipping hazard and the drop at the edge of the decking was obvious. Is that referring to what Hawkins described as the raised decking area or something else? Um, we're referring to the edge, the entire edge of the deck. Including the step? Not in that subparagraph. All right, next, D. The raised decking area was clearly defined and the edge was clearly visible. It did not form part of a circulation route and or in any event a barrier. The circulation route is picked up by the experts and what they're describing is whether going onto the raised upper deck is a circulation route, don't they? Yes. Is that what you're describing? Yes. That's the upper, circula uh, the upper raised decking. Yes, whether there's any need so to be So D, D is upper, so B is all, sorry to, to do this, but I need yes. to understand what you're saying. Uh, D, the raised decking area was clearly defined and the edge was clearly visible. The area did not form part of a circulation route. So this area is what you call the raised decking area. In that paragraph, yes. Yeah, well, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, and so that's raised. D, the relevance of this allegation is not understood. It's not alleged that the claimant's mother slipped near the jacuzzi steps. That's because you understood that she was saying she fell from what we're calling, what Hawkins called the raised deck area. Well, my lord, and it's, um, it's in the context... I understand um, why you pleaded it, but I just want to be clear. That, 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 that what, you're, what you're saying is uh, th this allegation is an irrelevance because you know that her case is she fell from what Hawkins called the raised deck area. Yes. Yeah. So that's talking about raised. And then uh, if you could help me just with... Q, I think, is the other one which one might look at. The surface of the deck, was, the, the edge of the decking was obvious. What's that referring to? The entire edge. The, the, the whole... Oh, okay. The, the whole jacuzzi area was raised. Thank you. Well, 
Lord, it, this is an argument that has been constructed for this appeal um, that wasn't um, a point that was taken below, and we say it wasn't taken below because um, there was never any misunderstanding by the appellant um, that we were putting the claimant proof as to where she fell, how she fell, and, and my lord, that... Well, how do we deal with that? We've got two distinguished leading counsel. Yes. One of whom says, acting for the claimant, I understood that this was not an issue. And you saying you didn't think they thought so. How can we deal with that? Well, my lord, you can look at how the trial was conducted uh, and how the closing submissions were, were dealt with. And, I mean, my lord, this is a fundamental and serious point mm. that is being made. Uh, and it is the very point there are leading and junior counsel sitting through a short trial, two-day trial. They're seeing the case being put, and in fact dealing with the case that's being put, as is um, Dr. Clements, who says on several occasions, I didn't tell anyone I slipped on the stand. The one that I've got in terms of analysing the case, I understand everything about the pleadings. I quite see the skeleton arguments and what judges say, very interesting, but not the end of the world. But am I right to think, first of all, it all depends on how we construe this case summary? Because if the case summary agrees that the location was not the step, or worse from your client's point of view, was the upper section of what's called the decking or the raised section, decking, if it means that, whether or not you raised it in argument and Mr. Williams didn't jump up and say he can't do that. It doesn't matter, does it? it or is that not the correct analysis of the shape of the case? Well, my Lord, if one goes to the conclusion that, that um, notwithstanding the submissions that are made, mm -hmm. um, that is how you construe it, mm -hmm. um, then you would have to go on to see um, if um, if that survived the um, the, the trial, not quite, because we could conclude that it didn't survive the trial, but by a process that was procedurally unfair. My Lord, yes. In which case, what would we do? Set it aside. Well, it would have, in my submission, if you came to that conclusion, um, because of the other issues, in addition to that, you would have to set it aside and order a retrial. If we, if we decided that it was procedurally unfair and that the judge should have taken the view that that finding was not open to him, then we know what finding he must have made otherwise, which was that it was at the decking, raised up the decking. We know what his conclusion would have been on liability. But what's the advantage of sending it back? Well, my lord, if you came to that view, um, that it, the judge should have found that it was not open to him, uh, then the judge should have put that to me and I would have had an opportunity to address him on that. Uh, and it is certainly um, open. Um, it, it's not a classic admission in a pleading. Um, I'm not aware at the moment that there is authority um, on case statements. But shouldn't you have been putting it to the judge? Shouldn't you have said, I'm about to suggest that we don't know yet if it's the step or the decking. I know we've agreed in the case summary, so I would like, if you don't mind, to have permission to leave to you the possibility of it being the, stair, the step. Why does the judge have to say, I've read the case summary, I've heard the evidence, but I'm going to go down a different route, and... Uh, or I'd like to be done this if you would, but I can't. Is there anything you'd like to say to me? Isn't it? If the case summary states the fact and we find that it's a fact, yes. what's the status really? The case summary, I suppose, I keep... Well, well the difficulty <laughs> with, <laughs> with, with the question 
uh, is um, that um, we don't start from that point. No, that's the problem. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah. of course, if if, um, uh, if if we took the view that the case summary um, um, contained an agreement that um, it should not contain, or that it should be qualified in some way, then I'd like to that we would have dealt with that. But that's not how we read the case summary, and it's not how um, the solicitor who drafted it intended it to be read. Uh, and it is also not how it was read um, by the judge or by my learned friend. And um, I, I don't mean this in, in, um, in an unkind way, but it's, it's an opportunistic point that arises after the event when looking at it. Um, but at the time, um, there was no concern um, that we weren't conducting the case entirely properly uh, and in the manner that it was expected that the case would be conducted. Uh, and two days is quite long enough um, for the point to have been taken. Uh, it wasn't taken, and we say that's because no one was misled by this. No, no one took the view that um, we were accepting that the only issue in the case was whether the point at which um, Dr. Clements fell should have been guarded. And you weren't advancing any case? Um, well, we were advancing a case that it, w um, that it wasn't slippery. Mm. Exactly. And, and so. And, and also, my lord, sorry to interrupt, and, and that the mechanism that was described um, was, uh, as a matter of science, <coughs> unlikely. Forward, forward. That works wherever. My lord, I'm answering the point um, yeah, but, uh, as to whether I'm we're trying, making. I'm trying to understand case. where it goes. Yes. I'm trying to understand where it goes. You, you, you were in on any view entitled to advance the positive case that she didn't slip. Yes. And that the mechanism that she described was not right. Was was yes. inaccurate. But what I'm having more difficulty with is the suggestion that that includes. I, I gave you the, the I gave you the, as what I would call the benefit of the doubt this morning that your cross examination was scrupulous and was explicable on the basis that you were going to mechanism and immediately what had happened before. If you remember my discussion with Mr. Wilkes. Um, as it, as it seems to me, that's still the case, haven't you? <laughs> my mind on that. I'm very pleased to hear that. Yeah, good. Um, but, if, but if that's right, then if we were to decide that um, it was an agreed fact that she fell from the raised decking, yes. if, which is not straightforward, if we were to, then your cross-examination doesn't go to location. Well, my lord, I put to the witness um, that um, she had reported to Corrie Bainbridge um, the um, facts that were recorded in the accident report, which did go to location. Uh, and I put to her in some detail the document that we're going to look at later this afternoon at 2.43, uh, in which um, Mrs. Dunbobin says that Dr. Clements told her, um, I better not paraphrase it, it's an important document, um, and it's recorded twice. Um, two, four, three. When explained what had happened, she informed us that she had slipped on the steps coming down and hit her bump quite hard on the left side. Um, and then in the next paragraph, I met the couple in the corridor and escorted them to the lower staircase. When asked how the accident happened, she said she'd worn the white bedroom slippers and had come out of the jacuzzi, put them on, walked down the steps and slipped, landing at the bottom of the steps. The problem that I've got with that is trying to recreate what's happened in looking at the case summary. I can see you've got the accident report and what Ms. Bainbridge said, and you've got the type report. Yes. Uh, all of which says walking down the steps, slipped and landed on the bottom step. 
But then I go back to 1.3 and 1.4, uh, and I suppose we've covered it really with the uh, block. But the best rule in the world, I can't see where Lucasia said to be an issue, and I can't avoid being obsessed by the words at the end of 1.4, fell from the raised decking area, where on this analysis, fell from the raised decking area, or when going down the steps. You, you, you see my difficulties. That was what was being built up to. It's funny that it's not left open. You, you see my I, problem. I see what you're you see saying. The problem, but you just say, that slide fell, I've just got to not be mesmerized by those last words, but read it, bearing in mind it refers to the pleadings and everything else, and um, what happened, you say, is confirmation that it was open, well, rather than a departure. And um, I, I've said that was our intention, yeah. and, and uh, um, it's, um, it doesn't seem, uh, when one looks um, at the way the trial was conducted, that anyone would... Um, was misled into thinking that we were agreeing that location wasn't an issue. You accept that the judge couldn't have said, I don't believe that Miss Clements ever fell. That would be a breach of the agreement. Yes. She, uh, she, she fell. She complained that um, she had um, struck her bum. She was concerned that she was a pregnant lady. Um, and um, we were very concerned about her, uh, and, um, and she went to hospital. Yes. So some things wouldn't have been open to the judge to find. He couldn't find no, she never fell. Yes, she fell on another day, but not this day. He had to, he was bound by the statement to a certain extent then, and that makes me think perhaps it's just a question of what does the statement mean? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll just go back to the pleadings. Yeah. I, don't oh, think, yeah. I don't think we're leaving... Um, the fact that she fell in its you. Well, we say we have no knowledge um, in, in paragraph 9. Paragraph 13 suggests it was a fall on another day. No, no, but I'm just, to, or even a fall, actually, yes. to say something else. Um, don't get sidetracked by another day. It's just that you've left everything to proof. Yes. But if the judge had found, I don't believe this woman fell, um, that wouldn't have been acceptable, and that can only be because of the statement, you see. So the statement's got to have some value, is what I'm struggling with. Case summary, rather. Well, my lord, uh, at the risk of repetition, yeah. our, our position was we accept that she fell um, from height, um, from somewhere in the vicinity of the jacuzzi. Uh, and my lord, um, that is exactly the way that um, um, we presented it in, in the closing submissions, if you go to um, page 160. Before you get on to your closing submissions, what about your opening skeleton? Is yes. there anything you want to say about that? Because we were taken through that in detail. Uh, I, was I was wondering whether you, is there any passage that you want to, uh, to refer us to, to which, uh, to which we weren't? or? My Lord, um, our intention in paragraph 5 was, was to set out um, an acceptance that Mr. Siddle and Mrs. and Dr. Clements went to the jacuzzi area. Yes. Um, we set out our understanding of her allegations, uh, and we say that various accounts are recorded as to the mechanism of the fall yes. and will be explored in evidence and that there were no witnesses. Uh, and um, it's our intention there to say that uh, um, there are various different accounts which clearly include um, the account 
to Corrie Bainbridge and to Mrs. Dunbobin, and they will be explored in evidence. The, um, and those you set out your understanding of the issues in paragraph 7. Yes. Um, well, no, my lord. We set out our understanding of the allegations. We say the voluminous allegations can probably be, be distilled into three, not the issues. And you say, presumably, that Mr. Williams is putting too much emphasis on the use of the word allegedly before slipped in paragraph 9, and you weren't not suggesting that the question of whether she fell over the edge was also an allegation. It's just, you say, unduly semantic to yes. read it in that way. Yes. The positive case you're putting in 10 as to the most likely cause of the fall. Yes. Walking too close to the edge. We're not resiling from that because um, uh, the stairs were at the same height. So you you say, uh, okay. So you, you say all your submission is that the case summary and the skeletons are consistent with um, a possible case, putative case, potential case that the accident that the injury was caused by slipping down the stairs. Yes. In the, 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 whether the slip is at the top uh, and, and she goes down the stairs or whether she slips on the stairs uh, isn't recorded um, in sufficient detail for us to put that. But we say that this, um, this is sufficient uh, to cover that, yes. And the judge summarised the issue. Um, was it slippery? Was there a barrier? So he uses the word issue. Uh, he does, and he, um, I'm not sure if um, the um, recording didn't catch it, but it, it seems to me when reading that that he was reading. Um, the summary of the allegations, because I haven't summarised the issues in my skeleton. I'm somewhere there when he is when he's well, reading that. Yes, but you, you, you're saying what people understood by the documents, and this would certainly uh, support the conclusion that the judge understood that those were the issues in the case. Yes, because he there he is summarising. Yes. Sorry, you, I, I, I was trying to deal with it in, his, in historical yes. progression, because I think you were taking us to your closing submissions. Well, my lord, just at, at 163, Twenty-nine. Yes. We so say we couldn't be clearer as to our case. We accept that Dr. Clements fell in the vicinity of the, and I, and I then called it the fall. Uh, and um, and that the issue, it seems, from the evidence is probably between was she on the raised ledge and fell over the ledge or she fell on the steps. And the judge agreed and said he was going to refer to the raised edge as the deck. And, What's and the raised ledge? Sorry? What's the raised ledge? Uh, well, um, it's the upper section of the deck, isn't it, where the ropes were? Well, or isn't it? I'd like to say, uh, because it suits me, um, that, that it's the whole edge. Mm -hmm. um, but That's I not what you said. Um, but I, I can. Oh, you're, sorry, I thought you were asking about the judge saying raised edge is the deck, the right hand deck. And I was going to say that um, 
I'd like to say that what he's saying there is um, that he's going to refer to the raised edge as the right-hand deck. But that's not what I was... I'm saying he's got a decision to make whether she fell anywhere on the raised area or down the stairs. Sorry, what's the ledge then? The raised ledge in your line 32. My Lord, I think the raised edge, I, I must have meant the right hand I'm raised area where, where she's saying she fell. Yeah. Because I'm saying the issue is did she fall where she says she fell? Or somewhere else. Yeah. On the Lord. On the steps, or on that higher ledge, not on the flat bit of deck in between the steps and the higher edge. Yes. Even then, it's not that. If you follow me. Um, sorry, could you? We had a lot of discussion at the beginning whether yes. the flat bit after you get off the steps and before you get to the section that's a bit up. Yes. That too, you were saying, was part of the decking. Yes, I'm not suggesting that decking, it was raised. Here, it's the, the two options are the raised ledge, which I read and understood to mean the bit where Dr. Uh, Clemens says she was, on that bit where you put your robes, Yes. where you step up and you put yes. your robes, or the steps. This doesn't look, when you get to the closing, as if you're saying there's a third possibility between the steps and... The flat no, I'm not. You're, you're absolutely right, my lord. Yes. yes. I'm, so I'm that's not. gone then. Um, and my Either lord, the steps or when this Dr. Clement says she fell. Yes, and, and my lord, um, uh, that was 163. If one goes to 166, line 25 to 35, there, there's. Um, um, a, a more detailed submission. So, my lord, there's an issue as to whether it's the steps or the deck. And if it's the steps, you have the difficulty of having no evidence as to what caused the fall. And certainly, that any deficiency in the design of the steps was relevant to the fall. <coughs> and the evidence is that, generally speaking, the steps are less slippery than flat surfaces, etc. If it's the ledge, then the decision for the court is to whether it actually matters whether she slipped, tripped, or fell and whether she should have been protected from whatever mechanism of fall by a barrier. And my strong submission is that when you carefully analyse the case, you'll see that other than the issue about whether she slips on the deck is a central issue. Um, and I'm uh, um, in code accepting the difficulties that I have about there not being a barrier, barrier there. Yeah. And that's why I agreed with um, my Lord, Lord Justice Stuart Smith this morning. If there were a finding, well, put it this way: there aren't all that many judges who are going to find in your favour that you didn't need a guardrail. Well, my lord, forever a realist, yes. <laughs> forever an optimist, you could say no, but well, I, I'm, I'm not, and no. And, no. I, and I hope we conducted um, the case entirely appropriately in that respect by um, saying we, we don't have independent evidence at all, and um, and that includes Mr. Siddle. Um, and, and therefore, um, one is looking um, at the policeman's notebook, in effect. Um, um, and it, it's entirely, um, we, we would say, um, the norm for courts to pay regard um, to contemporaneous documents and, and quite often to um, decide that they are the best evidence in cases. Um, but my lord, that's moving on to the other submissions. Uh, uh, I, I, I suspect you've formed a view as to uh, uh, whether there's an agreed fact, but um, from our perspective, it, uh, the words weren't intended to have that meaning. No one um, has suggested um, that prior to the grounds of appeal uh, that this was uh, an agreed fact. Uh, and indeed, um, when uh, 
um, Mr. Williams um, addressed the court in closing at um, at 170, uh, and he was addressing the court um, from 26 onwards uh, about no fall over the edge, but just to fall over the decking. And, and, uh, but here we have somebody who falls over an edge, a level edge from the deck. And in fact, whether she slips and the judge intervenes and says, or down the steps, that's the issue. And Mr. Williams agrees. Or down the steps, and I will come to that, yes. And uh, it goes on over the page, or down the steps. But here's an entirely different proposition. Judge Sefton, yes, well, you concentrate on whether it's on the deck or down the steps, because that, it seems to me as well, that's an issue with which the court has to be concerned. Um, my lord, this isn't a heat of battle moment. What's the position? If we and you may <coughs> have to be unkind. Myself. What's, what, no, no, no. To Mr. Williams. <laughs> what, what's the position? If we were to find that there was an agreed fact, and that the claimant could have stood upon there being a, an agreed fact, subject to the possibility of it being released yes. in whatever way. What's the what's the significance of? if any, of that passage that we've just looked at, where Mr. S Willem says, yes, that's the issue. Well, um, well two points. The, the, the first significance of it is uh, that um, I have addressed this court on the basis um, that um, it was clear uh, what we meant in the case summary and everyone proceeded on the basis that these were the issues. Uh, and I can see in the cold light of day that it may well, and I'm sure that uh, the drafters would not draft it in the same way again, but that doesn't mean that at the time it, it was an agreed statement. But secondly, um, at that point, um, somebody, um, whether it's the judge or Mr. Willems, has to, has to say, well, that's not an issue. Um, unless Mr. Block wants to persuade me uh, either um, that having heard the evidence, um, he um, should be able to um, revise the statement in the case summary um, or withdraw it if it's, if it's viewed to be um, permission. And there, there would be a discussion as to that. And, um, um, we, it's not the case um, of um, a claimant being ambushed uh, and attending um, a, an appellate court and saying, well, of course, if I'd realised that, I would have asked different questions. I would have presented my case differently. Um, I limited myself just to slipping and didn't deal with location. All of the evidence is there, and um, uh, I have to be careful how I phrase this, but it, it, it would be absurd if a judge thought um, that an accident happened uh, in a certain way, perhaps a, a way, and we see this sometimes, uh, not pleaded by either party, uh, and had to say, but I'm constrained to either accept uh, one case, which I don't think, Occurred, or another case which I don't think occurred. Um, the, the, the judge's role it, um, is to decide um, the case on the evidence. Well, the and judge's role is to decide the issues that they are asked to decide. And I, I think you may have missed the point of, of my question. Assu assume against yourself that until you get to what Mr. Willems says, yeah. we're still thinking, hmm. We're not content. We're not happy about this. Yeah. What is the impact of Mr. Willems saying that is the issue at that point? Because in the normal way, judges accept what what counsel, leading or junior, say. If someone says that's an issue, then a judge will go on and decide it. If Mr. Willems had said this is not an issue, yeah. 
then, as you suggested, a different course, any number of courses back in. And I, I'm, I'm concerned, if we get this far, as to which certainly I have not made up my mind, if we get this far, what the impact of that statement by Mr. Willems is, and whether the impact of it is, you may have been able to, you may have been able to um, object to it, but you didn't, and therefore, the, it, it's not suggested it was unfair. He wasn't induced to say that by unfairness. Therefore, any potential procedural unfairness up to that point is waived, obviated. Would that be your submission, or, or would you say, which may be right, even so, if we get that far, the procedural, we, we should be, and I'm not asking you to concede this, but the, yes. the, the alternative is if we get that far, something has gone seriously wrong in the state of Denmark and, and it needs to be put right. Don't know how, whether we remit the whole thing or so on and so forth. Well, my lord, um, I'm not sure that he'd really thought this through when he said it, but uh, Mr. Williams this morning uh, said that uh, I, I think, if I recall correctly, that the case summary was a, a, a contractual agreement. Uh, That's right. Uh, no, he did say that. But um, yes, well, I didn't write down the word well, my, contractual. He said it. Uh, I think he meant akin to uh, but <coughs> binding is what he was getting at. But, my lord, if, I, I don't accept that there's any merit in, in, in that, but um, um, rhetorically, isn't he in the same position? Um, that whatever may have gone before, uh, he has agreed that there is an issue for the court to determine. Okay. To be fair to Mr Williams, if we look at actually what happened, um, and he's happily going on about Dr uh, Clemens falling over the edge of the deck, yes. and suddenly the judge pops up and says, or down the steps, that's the issue. Mr Williams doesn't say, oh yes, that's the issue. He says, or down the steps, I'll come to that. So he's not saying anything about it at that stage, to be fair to him. Judge Sefton says, yes, or down the steps, but here's an entirely different position. And then Judge Sefton says, well, uh, that's the issue with which the court has been concerned. And Mr. Williams says, right, which is slight bastard to speak for goodness me, what's he on about now? The client herself, Dr. Clements rather, has never said she fell down the steps. And it doesn't seem to me that when you read the whole thing and you analyse it, that it's right to take a couple of sentences and treat those when they're said as having some sort of magic. It's all a bit more nebulous at that stage. You're clear in what you're saying is the issue, although it's not the issue that you say in the skeleton, it's the upper deck or on the steps. That's what you're saying at 163 yes. or whatever it was. And Mr. Williams seems to be a bit taken by surprise and doesn't really grapple or say to the judge firmly, no, you've got it wrong. Well, well, where we get to with that, I don't know. I still wonder whether the first question is what the statement means. I say that's right. It does mean what Sorry. Some people say it, say it means, then are you stuck with it or not? Whatever you said and whatever Mr. Williams said, that's the problem that I've got. Well, I'd, I'd say that's rather kind to Mr. Williams. In this sense, that um, he's heard me say it um, at least twice in my closing. That's true, yeah. Uh, and the judge agree with me. Um, he's had it put to him by the judge um, twice. Yeah. Uh, and um, and also, uh, he has seen me put to, uh, in effect, his client, <sighs> the two contemporaneous documents. Um, and I, I say that it is kind to say, well, yeah. he hasn't really grappled with it. It's, it's as he said, the, the, the heat of the battle moment. Um, you know, we are experienced common law counsel who mm. um, conduct these trials not as regularly as we used to, but uh, and sitting through. Um, it, it's difficult to imagine, if, if you could take yourself back two days in practice, sitting through um, two days of a trial and getting to closing speeches and watching the way that the defendants have presented this case. Um, 
and being um, confident that um, there has been, um, in effect, an admission as to the location, and letting the trial carry on in this way. Um, th there's no question of, of misleading. And so back to um, well, Justice Stuart Smith's question, where that leaves us. Say, if, um, if an informed member of the public sat and watched that trial, uh, it, it's difficult that they would think that, well, the, the claimant um, um, was maintaining <coughs> that there was no issue to be resolved here. And how do we compare with an informed member of the public? Well, I hope you're at least as informed as an informed member of the public, my lord. Um, but what I'm saying is it... But, but I think the substantial... I think you have given an answer to my question, which is that, that the, the effect of... 163 and 169, and then 170, 171. Effectively, however else one analyzes it, means that the claimant cannot complain that this was no longer an issue for the judge. Yes. Even if he could have done before. Yes. And you would also say that in reality, this isn't a case where there would have been different evidence or other witnesses. All the people who could say what happened on that day, which is the ultimate issue. Were there who gave evidence? Yes, it, it, which is a very important point because um, one can think of cases that have been run on a, on a narrow basis because of, of the pleadings, uh, and then something comes up, and, and it, it's. I was in the court of appeal not long ago, and the exact point: the evidence that had never been tested um, was then put to the court of appeal, and. Uh, um, it's, it's not an unusual circumstance for us, but this is a case in which uh, there were no more witnesses. Right. Um, that probably deals with Let's draw on. agreement. Yes. Yes. Um, Lord, I I wonder before I go on to other points whether I should clear the decks with the metadata because um, it, it's in one sense a discreet issue. Um, there was a non-core trial bundle uh, which described in the index um, the document at 243 as accident sorry, as typed sheet with Angela Dunbobbin's account of the incident. That was prepared by the claimant solicitor, I understand. Sorry, with her account of the incident. Yes, it, I'll, I'll dictate it to you. Typed sheet with Angela Dunbobbin's account of the incident. September 2019, uh, the document was provided to the claimant solicitor, as I understand. And in the defendant's list of documents, and the defendant served more than one list of documents, um, but I think it was a um, Yes, it refers back to previous ones. Uh, item 83 in the list of documents states, Accident Report of Angela Dunbobbin, 1st of January 2017. And this list is dated the 9th of June 2022. 22? Yes. Uh, because we can't see it. Yes. Accident report of Angela Dunbody, 1st of January 2017. Is it clear from the description whether that is describing the date of the incident or the date of the document? It's the date of the document. Um, there's right. a Because quite often you have a column to the right saying date of document. Yes. Is that what it is? It is. There are three columns. 
The first is document number, the second is height, is document, and the third is date. And then it's quite clear from the dates as you go through that they are all the dates of the documents. So the description is report of Angela Dunbobin. Accident date. report of Angela Dunbobin yes. is in the middle column. Yes. And in the end column is 01.01.2017. Thank you. Um, my Lord, um, disclosure was not performed electronically. The documents were provided as hard copies. Is it still is it still a rule that if a document isn't if a document description isn't challenged, it's taken to be what it's said to be? As far as I understand. It used to be under the RFC. Yeah. But it was taken to be what it is, but not as the truth of its content. Yes. Yes. Okay. As, I, as I understand it, that's still the position. And my lord, just it, it's a, a a point in answer to um, a learned friend. Um, I think suggesting the view this morning that, um, that it, it, it was um, put in evidence um, at the beginning of Mrs. Dunbobin's evidence and that um, Dr. Clements and Mr. Siddle didn't have a chance to deal with it. Um, that's wrong. It, um, it was put to Dr. Clements. And Described by my learned friend. Sorry, which, which talk? 52 is. Well, we're talking about the 243 document, the, um, the typed yes. document, and uh, I think the suggestion that was put was that um, I um, only adduced it, uh, which is. No, I understand that. I suppose what I, correct in one sense, um, when Mrs. Dunbobin gave her evidence, because it <coughs> wasn't in the witness yes, statement. Something was only independently proved or attached to yes. this. But the document at the bottom of page 52 is the accident report form. Isn't no, it's, it? It's the type document. It's not the one that says it's an accident report. That's a separate one. Well, You're in the middle of the transcript. Mullen's correct. 52 does refer to the answer report form. The next page deals with the... Time. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So where do we get that being introduced, is what I was looking for. Um, so it's the type of account. I see. Page 7 and 8. Yes. It, it's what and she I found. think was described as page 6. Yes. No, sorry. No, I see. I just hadn't seen that. I've just. Thank you. Yes. And then I put the contents... The witness. Yes, thank you. Um, my Lord, I, I, I can't recall in, well, in any days, even with electronic documents, that metadata is generally um, disclosed in lists of documents. Uh, and um, it certainly uh, wasn't the case uh, with um, non electronic disclosure that one went back to um, to, to look at um, information from the computer um, that was connected to, to producing. It's not normal and also quite frequently 
a document like this, the, the type document, would be turned into a PDF, and then the PDF would be disclosed. Yes. It, and that would be the extent of the electronic. I mean, I, I certainly did have experience of cases where the demand was always for the raw document with metadata. Um, but that was not this sort of case. Well, or the classic of that is where um, a um, pleading um, is disclosed um, in yep. Word, and some clever recipient then looks yep. at earlier versions. Yeah. Um, so, my lord, this is important because uh, the general request for information in the email um, that you looked at this morning uh, was never going to produce metadata in this case. No, but I think the allegation was it says the computer had been destroyed, and therefore how is it suddenly that you've got the computer that mentioned it? And that's what I understood the criticism to be. Well, the computer had been changed, yeah. yes. But, um, my lord, um, you will know that um, one usually transfers over working documents to new computers, and this was a, was a Word document. So We'll just assume that's what happened. So, um, uh, and my lord... This is one thing that it's very easy to see um, what happened. It, uh, Mr. Dunbobbin, who had nothing direct to give evidence about, um, came to court with his wife. And he sat and heard her being challenged by Mr. Willems. Um, and he went back to look at the document. And, um, um, my Lord, as, as I said to the learned judge, I've got it. Um, whether it's my obligation for continuing disclosure, because Mr. Williams can't have it both ways. It's either a disclosable document or it's not. Um, I've got it. Um, and uh, at a very early point in that discussion um, um, with, with the, the judge, it became clear that Mr. Williams accepted that the judge should look at it and it should be a matter of what weight is given to it. Um, Lord, he then makes um, criticisms. How do we know it's related to this event? Uh, and um, I can see the force of, of those criticisms uh, in one sense, um, but in another sense, um, it's a document that, uh, on the face of it, uh, must be relating to um, the New Year's Day um, spa event with Dr. Clemens. Once you've gone that far, there's no other document that um, has been produced um, to the court um, that this could relate to. Uh, and the timings, and I need to deal with timings in another context, um, the timings do work in the sense of looking at 243. Because the last time on 243 is 3.30, and the last time on this is 3.38, or 15.38. My lord, to treat it with caution, uh, and certainly not to base a judgment on it, um, we entirely agree that's correct. Um, we say it's a matter for the judge as to whether he gives it any weight at all. Um, one, it, it, once it's admissible, it doesn't follow as night follows day that it must have no weight. And if it has consistencies with... Um, and the judge... Uh, has formed an impression, bearing in mind this comes after the witnesses, has formed a very clear impression of the witnesses uh, and of Mrs. Dunbobbin um, being honest. Um, we say it's unfortunate um, that when one gets a document at something like 10 to 2, and, um, that there isn't uh, a witness statement. But if a witness statement came and said the same as the um, the email which has been handed to the court, that would be the limit. It wouldn't prove the provenance of it anymore. And you would have a statement of truth attached. 
make a statement, and that's why you have them, or one of the reasons why you have them. Lord, I accept that. People know that this is serious stuff. Yes. But Lord, the, the learn well, first of all, I say that um, the learned judge was entitled to give it some weight. Um, but if you're against me on that, I, I say it's clear um, from other aspects of the judgment that even without the metadata, um, he was he had formed a view that Mrs. Dumbobin had prepared that statement on the 1st of January. Well, the timings are very difficult. Um, they start off by being difficult because um, Dr. Clements and Mr. Siddle are clearly wrong in their witness statements about the time that they went to the spa, and he read the cross-examination about that. I don't think I need to go back to that. Um, you've got an accident report which, um, at the moment, um, the judge has found he can have no regard to because of what was said, but then um, it is still used um, by Mr. Willems in cross-examining uh, and putting the 150 time. Uh, you've then got 243, uh, where you've got the time of uh, 2 o'clock at the top of it, uh, and then you've got the 3.15 and the 3.30 in the paragraphs at the bottom. Um, somehow that has to be married up with the document at 2.48 in Penrith, which says, 1510 and well that gets that gets the form to about 10 past 2 yes and then there's everything so we're not that's not far off well 150 2 o'clock maybe um, it, it depends on how far away it is and how long the phone call to um, Dr. Clements's own clinician took yeah. and the fact that she um, and I know that this is to some extent not absolutely clear but did she sit in reception did she spend some time um, in a treatment room um, on a bed she went up to her bedroom to change out of her mm. wet clothes uh, it, it's they can't have been leaving the building and going to the car park at 3.30, can they? That doesn't feel right. That can't be doubtful, isn't it? That um, the note is accurate if it means that Mr. N Bobbin called Mr. and Mrs. Clements if it was in their room at 3.15. Well, my lord, I, I agree. It doesn't... That doesn't seem right it, either. It, it doesn't add up, but then there are there are some other things um, that don't quite add up as well. Um, if one looks at um, Dr. Clement's witness statement, um, that she says, in, it's the one behind tab eight, if you please go to paragraph 24, one eight six. Well, perhaps um, just to see how she was describing matters, if we go back a page to one eight five years, um, the sparse uh, in paragraph twenty five, the third line, the sparse staff were helpful. They took me to a room and gave me a glass of water. They tried 
got the reassurance, told me everything would be fine, offered to call an ambulance, etc. Um, 26, we got back to our room. As I lay on the bed, I was conscious I couldn't feel George moving anymore. I grew more and more concerned, and I called the Jessops, the hospital she was registered under in Sheffield, years, who then advised her to go. And we phoned Penrith and informed them we were on our way. Uh, and then they were seen straight <coughs> away in paragraph 27. Uh, and 28, we were there for about an hour in total. The antenatal nurse was then happy for me to return to the hotel. She made some notes on a piece of paper and advised me to pass this to my antenatal nurse in Sheffield when I returned home. And we were allowed to go back to the hotel. I was advised if I felt that George was still not moving overnight, and I should seek an urgent scan. So it, it's not entirely clear if she was at the hospital for an hour. Uh, and then, and um, if the note is timed at when she arrives, it's a possibility. It doesn't work for when she left. No. The, the note is timed 3.10. Yes. And in any normal case, you'd expect that to be when the note is made up. Um, wouldn't you? And it says, he's here, uh, perhaps the fall was an hour ago. So the note's got yes. to be made up. That takes a little bit of time. Then it's given to them, and you're stretching back towards an hour in the hospital as, as, a, as a whole. Yes, yeah, so you're at four-ish. You're probably at, well. You're probably you're after three ten. And then you've got to get back to the hotel. Yes. Um, the thing that troubles me too, according to the metadata, the fire was created at two fifty-four. Yes. And last modified at three thirty-eight. And you look at that and. The last paragraph may not be the last modification. Says at three thirty she was going to the car park. Now I'm trying to put my mind into place. Somebody sitting in front of the computer screen at sometime up to three thirty-eight, yes. recording what's happened between two fifty-four and three thirty-eight, even if it's done in stages, and saying then that. Um, there's been a telephone call in the hotel, effectively, at 3.15, and that she's seen a couple leave the building at 3.30. I can't see how that fits with the metadata, how that could have come to be and how somebody could be typing those words, believing them to be accurate. Either they made a mistake or, or it's just not right. But it's hard to see how that note can be an accurate recreation of the chronology of the event Lord, I respectfully agree. Um, so how can a judge put weight on something that is, it clearly can't be correct? But you say he can put weight on the bits of the paragraph that is that is favourable, but whilst ignoring the, the bits that can't be correct. My Lord, it's not unusual for um, witnesses um, to be considered to be Truthful witnesses and have some evidence that is accepted by a court. Yeah, I understand that. It's just the um, my lord, the um, the thing that um, impressed the judge, I think, is that um, Mrs. Dunbobbin um, was clear that um, she had in the note that she spoke. Dr. Clements and wrote down what she said, mm. and he considered that that, um, that that was evidence that was central. Um, I agree that his reconstruction of the timings, um, that the note would have been written as she left, doesn't work. You agree what? The, 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 the judge found um, that the note would have been written after Dr. Clements left, and that can't be correct. <coughs> but we say that doesn't undermine, because he, he, has, um, he has two central witnesses in the case. He listens to their accounts, uh, and um, he assesses um, the... Um, their credibility as witnesses uh, and 
the important points in the note um, about the conversation, important for my case, that is, um, the important points in the note here. Sorry, what conversation? Are we, are we talking about the first paragraph or the second paragraph? Both. Um, but, right. But um, more... This. Can, how does this tie in with the handwritten note? Can you just remind me about the handwritten note on the back of the accident report form? That's Mrs. Dunbar's writing. That was her Well, it, it ties in to this extent, or not ties in, that the first note is timed at um, 5 p.m. No, that's sparring for... Oh, sorry, spa. Yeah. Yes, so, sorry. Yes. Um, um, I'm misreading. Um, so, was there any... What's the last paragraph? Um, AD spoke to in bar to make sure she was OK. Said she would go to her midwife and get checked again, as hospital had advised. So, this is after, um, after she came back from Penrith... Right. Um, so that's, that's not recorded in the note, in the type note. No, because so the type on. note is, on our case, is completed before that. Well, according to the metadata. Um, could you just help me on one other word? In the end of the first paragraph, the one line to the bottom, A and E, everybody has called the next word lady, but it looks more like Julie to me. I think it is Julie as well. Is your client by chance in court? Um, no. Can we, can we work up? We the think it's lady. It we think it's lady. You what? think it's lady? My instructions list think it's Okay, lady. well, the judge thought it was lady. Yes. I'm just being difficult. What about you going to deal with Mr. Siddle's evidence? Yes. Okay. Um, my Lord, so that, I, I, I thought it would be helpful to deal with 243 and the metadata first, um, and then move on to the, the other points. Um, with regard to Mr. Siddle's evidence, the view that we took, rightly or wrongly, was that um, he um, didn't witness the accident uh, and um, that he was uh, unlikely to um, be of assistance uh, with, with regard to um, what his wife had said, and also that we didn't think that would be of assistance. So. Uh, I thought he did assist with what his. I thought he said his wife do. told her when she. Uh, he was walking away. He, he heard her screaming. Turned around. She was on the floor in a fetal position, I think. And didn't she tell him what had happened? My lord, that's what's in his witness statement. Uh, yeah. Yes, and we didn't challenge it. And we accept uh, that. But so he was useful to one extent. If, if what he says is accurate, he's the first person to hear and speak to Dr. Clems after. The incident occurred. Yes, we, we say that that's against the general weight of the evidence. Well, no, because none of the other evidence of the other witnesses is thought reliable at all. It's only the. Um, well, the written evidence, we, we say. It's, it's only this type note. The, yes. the accident report wasn't relevant, it wasn't reliable. Mr. Bobbin, Miss Bainbridge, and indeed, according to the judge, Dr. Clemens, were not reliable. So the only witness who well, hasn't been challenged was Mr. Sidler. Oh. Well, Lord, his witness statement is made some four years later. But you didn't challenge it. We didn't, didn't challenge it. You didn't cross at all. No. And it's the first account that she gave. So we should take as reliable, should we, that the first, within seconds of her falling, with her husband, who had just been walking up to be, who had been walking away, turned around almost immediately. And she says she'd slipped and fallen from the decking. Woman. Not for stairs. Well, we accept that that's what he, he, he records. That's what she says. Yeah. You didn't challenge that. No, we didn't. Said. Well, isn't that quite significant evidence as the first account of what happened? Well, it's hearsay, yes. But she, understandably, is in a state of great distress, and 
you can criticise her evidence up here and down there. But you've got someone else who, although they're involved, gives you the immediate reaction. And the judge doesn't even mention it. Well, my lord, the judge mentions Mr. Siddle as not witnessing the accident. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Yes. Uh, and you'll be aware of the um, plethora of authority that the, the judge doesn't have to do set out everything that the witness says. Oh, come on. Come on, Mr. Judge. You know, you, you know what I'm pressing you on. Yes. What explanation is there for not taking into account the first account that she gave? Explanation for the judge not taking that into mm -hmm. account. Um, he observed um, all of the evidence in the case and weighed it. Okay, I've written down, tell me if I'm being unfair, no explanation for not referring to it. Well, not, not from the judge, there isn't, no. no for, for judge not referring. If I do draw to your attention what he does say. Mm -hmm. I've got She'd slipped and fallen from the deck. It, it's paragraph at page 42, um, in paragraph 19. I heard from Mr. Siddle. Unfortunately, he was unable to help me on the issues that I considered crucial to my decision. In particular, he did not witness Dr. Clement's fall, and he has no recollection of what was said to whom about the accident after the event. That was well, that's it. not correct, is it? He did have a record of what was said to whom about the accident after the event, because he has a recollection that she, Dr. Clements, told me, Mr. Siddo, that she'd slipped and fallen off the decking. In his witness statement, yes. Mm. Which was not challenged. That's correct, Lord. That's a decision that we, we took. Well, I'd, I'd, I'm sure. Yeah. And I can well understand the sort of the reasons I haven't completely forgotten, the reasons why a dependent decides not to challenge a witness sometimes. Yes. And I wouldn't dream of asking you what your reasons were, because that would be applying upon legal professional privilege. But the fact remains, you didn't challenge it. And the judge appears not to have taken it into account. Well, my lord, you, you have uh, at pages um, 63 through beyond 66 the oral evidence, and my lord, on th line 13, page 66, I can't remember in all, where did you hang the rope? So I can't remember in all honesty. I couldn't tell you whether it was in the middle or the right or the left, just one of them. It was just one of them, yes. Uh, and you didn't see your wife fall, you just saw the aftermath. Yes, that's right, yes. And that, that is the totality of the evidence. Not really, but in 64, he's shown the statement that we've just looked at, and he's asked, is this statement true and correct, and do you wish to adopt it as your evidence? Yes. I do, yes, he says. It is true, it is correct. <laughs> anyway, well, you can't ignore that as well. You can't just hop about. You've got to look at everything. Well, well, well my <laughs> lord, I, I, I know your... Um, hmm? I know your reasoning, but I, I mean, one could say that about all the witnesses in this case. They all confirmed their statements were true, and then, yeah. and then they were uh, examined on particular bits, and, and then had no current, apart, no current recollection. Yeah. Yes, I understand that. But what the judge is saying is that, uh, that Mr. Siddle has no recollection of what was said to whom. Um, now, putting it at its broadest, that's a, a misstatement of the evidence. My lord, I agree. Um, so it's the judge, uh, in coming to his conclusion, um, yeah, misstating the evidence. My lord, that's plain. Mm. So that's Mr. Siddle's evidence. Um, and, and then, I, I suppose the, on, the only other issue that you're probably still interested in is um, whether um, 
the judge um, was entitled within his broad uh, discretionary ambit um, to make the findings that he did about the evidence of Mrs. Dunbobin and Dr. Clement. Yes, and Dr. Clements is the previous paragraph, isn't it? It's paragraph 18. It so is. Unless it takes you out of your order, it might be convenient to deal with that now. Um, my Lord, the foundation um, of the findings in this paragraph, and I'm not avoiding dealing with a mistake that's made, I, I'll deal with that, but the foundation of it is um, that uh, when one put together um, Dr. Clements's accounts chronologically, uh, it was, um, we say, um, although that went, um, an account to Corey Bainbridge, followed by an account to Mrs. Dunbobbin, uh, followed by uh, an email in August of 2017, followed um, by another email towards the end of that year. Uh, and it was only the following year when Owen Mitchell were instructed that an account came uh, that she had slipped when placing her foot into a slipper. We accept that she had complained at the outset about wet slippers, uh, and she clearly, in her mind, thought it was the fact that the slippers were wet that was the cause of her fall. Um, but uh, in her early accounts, it was all um, she took a step and slipped. <laughs> And she accepted in her evidence um, that one couldn't um, in, one couldn't argue that um, that was consistent with what she was saying uh, in her witness statement and at trial. Hang on just for a second. I think I can accept your characterization of her earlier, which you said in early steps took a took a step and slipped. Yes. That's not what's recorded by Mr. Mr. Dunbobbin or by Corrie Bainbridge. No. Not in those terms, but perhaps I, I, I wasn't for legal purposes. Lord, I, w I wasn't saying in those. Sorry, I, I, there was a first account, Corrie Bainbridge, which was. The steps. There was a second account to Mrs. Dunbobbin, which was the steps. Um, the first account that came, so neither of those talked about putting slipper on and slipping in the motion. Um, then the first account that is unequivocally and can't be argued against from Dr. Clements comes in an email in, in August. Is the point you're making that the earlier accounts to refer to steps? No. Not to, that she'd taken a step, but she. Are you saying she. No, this is a different point because mm -hmm. it, it, it's the, the platform for a submission that I'm going to make about okay. where the judge found her um, to be. Um, well. Um, the way she gave her evidence to reflect on her honesty or credibility. Um, she then sent the email of the 17th of August. And without going to it, you can see the email. You can see um, through the cross-examination at page 54 of the transcript. Where Sorry, I, 
sorry, page 54. Yes, uh, at line 22. Um, I, I put the question, yes, and you gave an account here. Sorry, if you go up two lines, you'll see it's the email of the 17th yes. of August. Um, I'd hung the dressing gown on a hook by the hot tub, taken off the slippers at the same time. It had been raining, the slippers were wet. After using the hot tub, I'd put the dressing gown and slippers back on and took a step. The combination of wet slippers on top of the wet hot tub ledge was like walking on ice. I slipped, I fell off the ledge, my pregnant bump hit a step on the way to the floor. Uh, and I asked her, uh, why didn't you in this account describe what you've described in your witness statement to the court about putting on one slipper and then going to put on the other slipper and slipping? And why did you use the expression took a step? Uh, um, my Lord, um, this is the beginning of a series of exchanges that go across a number of pages, which um, I see um, Lord, Lord Justice Lewis is nodding. Um, I, I assume you're all familiar We've with, read it. with it. We've and read it. Um, uh, despite the valiant efforts of, of, of Mr. Williams, it, it, it was strange, um, to, um, at the least, um, that um, Dr. Clements um, seemed um, to think that one didn't have to give uh, an accurate account um, for a health and safety investigation. Um, and um, that she wasn't in her mind linking dealing with uh, an insurer about uh, an accident that she had already alleged. <coughs> and you know it's in dispute because um, a very sad um, disability for her um, child. Uh, and it, it, it's the exchanges over um, the following pages. I, I, um, for example, uh, page 56, line 30, um, when she says, well, this isn't written in a legal accurate way. It's written to communicate points I wanted to communicate at the time. What's wrong with that? Um, she's not a lawyer. Well, it doesn't have to be legal. But she, she's an intelligent lady. She's a doctor. Uh, and why would she write something that's inaccurate? I'm not asking her to say um, that the... Um, the constituent components of a tort are made out. I'm asking you to say what happened. And she is writing what happened, and she chooses to write something different. My Lord, I entirely agree. It doesn't have to be set out in legal language, but um, she accepted uh, that she had not described what she was now describing. Um, and... Um, Uh, the judge was simply not impressed by answers such as at 27, line 27 on the same page. Um, well, I stepped into the slipper, but it's more of a communication. So I've always known I slipped forward, and I slipped while I was putting my foot into the slipper, and I kind of simplified it. So I think on reflection, you're probably right. This isn't written in a legal, accurate way. This is kind of, it's written to communicate the points I wanted to communicate at the time. And then we put to her, well, it's it's not accurate. Um, and there are a couple of pages of how she sought to explain why it didn't matter that it wasn't accurate because she wasn't bringing a claim. I don't think she said it didn't matter. Did she? My Lord, that's my words. Um, but it's it certainly... Um, she, she's saying I didn't... In effect, I didn't have to give an accurate account. I just had to communicate. She accepts at the top of page 58, line 1. So this is the first account 13 month plus months after the fall that describes the putting on of slippers as being the, as you were putting on the slippers, you slipped. Do you accept that? That's the first time you've notified my insurers of that? Yes.
is are the next three lines the bits where the judge is saying um, yeah, it had to intervene because she wasn't coherent or her response was not coherent yes and so she starts to say um, at the moment I think that that thought is what I remember very clearly she's saying are you saying that's the thought that I remember very clearly and then she says can I have a glass of water and, um, and then I ask her again and she says uh, at line 30 so it wasn't that I changed my mind because when I'd written the previous documents I just wanted to simplify it I wasn't going into too much detail it's also because when the solicitor takes you through kind of and you describe what happened to your solicitor when you first meet them you have to show them kind of what happened with the accident. Um, and I, I challenge her on that and tell her I'm going to be su submitting, so I'll give her a chance to answer this. It's difficult to understand that the two persons who make contemporaneous notes of what you said, leaving aside whether it was a slip on steps or lead, do not record anything that could begin to describe I was putting my slippers on and lost my footing. And then in your email account, um, that's the August one and then the later one. Uh, again, there's nothing that could be interpreted as being consistent with I was putting my slippers on and my foot slipped. Why is that and why is it that it suddenly comes to your mind 30 months later as being what happened? And so it's, you've got your first document for the case which says what happened and the previous documents were written about litigation in mind. It wasn't written, it was written to get points across. Um, and... Uh, Why is that implausible? Well, my lord, it's implausible um, that um, the mechanism that she describes 13 <coughs> years later um, was what she was seeking um, to explain in her earlier accounts. It is just so different. <coughs> One is it's in the process of putting a slipper on. The other is her slippers are on and she takes a step. And my Lord, it, it is the problem with um, accidents that one takes a, um, a, an event that often takes a split second or just a number of seconds and then dissects them in court, in this case six years later. Uh, and we would give every... Um, proper consideration to that, but this is contemporaneous. Well, sorry, this um, not contemporaneous. These are um, accounts that are given, uh, ranging from contemporaneously through to the next um, twelve months. And well, the only two that don't deal with this isn't it August and the end of the year, isn't it eight months and twelve months later? Yes. Well, and it, um, uh, depending on what view one takes as to, I, I think I must leave the accident report aside, yes. despite the fact it exists, yeah. but whatever view one takes of page That's two. That's the author's record of what they say. Yeah. Uh, uh, whatever um, views one, one takes of 243, um, it certainly doesn't include uh, an account um, when asked what happened. I was putting my slipper on and my foot slipped. But I do accept, um, I don't know if this is the point that I was just about to be challenged with that she had just fallen and was distressed on the day and I, I, I wouldn't criticise her for not giving No, I was, I was going to go to the intermediate and I, I fully accept that people's recollections this experience of the courts that people's recollections change and you're entitled to test, test whether that's right but can we just deal with the two emails because her explanation is that she sent the first email because by then her son had been born and there was known to be a problem and he felt, she felt it was important to write to the hotel. Yes. It, it doesn't read like a claim document. It reads like, a, to my eyes at any rate, it reads like a document of someone who's concerned, who's raising matters for consideration. <coughs> the reply comes back, we will investigate. She says, I was pleased by that. I think the word she uses chucked, but anyway. She says she was pleased by that. And then there came a time when she asked to see the report and she 
We were told she couldn't, and then she wrote the, seven, the one on the 17th of December, which is a slightly different tone I, to, to, my, to my eyes. Is there anything inherently implausible about any of that? Because it's an explanation she gave quite coherently to my eyes, two or three times. My Lord, um, page 244 is 17th of August. Yep. Uh, and uh, I accept, um, with respect, you must be right that there, there is no indication uh, here that um, she is intimating a claim. Um, but um, I'm relying on the letter uh, as an account that she has chosen to write to my client in which um, she could just have said um, I slipped and fell but she chose to give more detail um, the slippers were wet. After using the hot tub, I put the dressing gown and slippers back on and took a step. The combination of wet slippers on top of the wet hot tub ledge was like walking on ice. Um, I slipped, I fell. We say that that is taking a step, that is walking, that is not, I was in the process of putting a slipper on and my foot slipped. My Lord, I can see you're not impressed, but we are by, by, by the point, and so was the judge. Uh, Mr. Wills, you shouldn't believe a word you think you can see. <laughs> but you I say it's not a matter for us anyway. You say that's classically what the judge is urging. Yes. He's got the two emails, he's got Dr. Fleming, and he must form a view on that. Yes. And, and my Lord, if you go over to 246. This is written a number of months later, and it, it can't be suggested here that Dr. Clemens is not seeking to give a pretty full and accurate account. It, again, um, whether um, she has in mind a claim or is just um, uh, concerned that others shouldn't fall, is a matter of conjecture, but um, she's provided us with a photograph, she's tagged it, um, she's explained what she did. Uh, on leaving the hot tub, I went to the ledge on the right side to retrieve the dressing gown and slippers. I put on the dressing gown and slippers, I took a step while still on the ledge, I slipped. So again, she's got beyond putting on the slippers and she's taking a step. And it is important because um, we have always struggled knowing the, the properties of the mill board and the slippers um, to understand uh, how this accident happened. Um, we and the experts have particular difficulty with her walking and slipping. It's also difficult to understand how the, um, the slipper would have gone forward as she described on the expert evidence. But um, what is clear is that she was giving uh, in these two accounts a very different account to the one that she gave after she had been to Owen Mitchell and a letter. We submitted to the court that there's no satisfactory explanation for that. It doesn't work well when you prepare a report for a hospital investigation. It doesn't really matter how accurate it is. Um, when the claim comes, we'll, we'll think about it a bit harder and give a more accurate account. Um, the analogy of a hospital investigation really works against it rather than for. 
I, I can see if it were an abbreviated but accurate account, that may be um, a fair explanation. And the content of her answers, plus the manner in which she, she gave them, um, caused the judge to have um, the concerns that he expresses in paragraph 18. Just for completeness, when he says it was put to her about the accident, um, she didn't deny the suggestion um, that she said put them on, walked on the steps and slipped. That, that's not accurate, is it? Because she did deny that. My Lord, that's exactly what I was oh, sorry, coming okay. to. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm so um, sorry. Half of that sentence um, uh, is correct. Dr. Dr. Clements didn't deny the suggestion. She explained the slippers she was wearing had caused her to slip. That's correct, because she had always thought it was the slippers that caused her to slip. Um, but she did say on several occasions, uh, I didn't fall down the stairs and I didn't tell anyone that I fell down the stairs. That's me paraphrasing. But, yeah. um, the judge is wrong about that particular so, thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I, I said when I started these submissions, and you asked me to go to Dr. Clements first, um, that I accepted there had been a mistake. Um, that's the mistake. It's a very big mistake. Um, I accept that. Um, but it doesn't alter, for the reasons that I've just given to you, um, <coughs> the... Um, sorry, it, it, does, it, it doesn't diminish the point that the judge was entitled on hearing how Dr. Clements um, dealt with um, the various accounts uh, that he did not find her to be a credible witness. Thank you. And then you were going to deal with Miss uh, Bob in seven minutes for next, was that? Yes. It? Yes. I'm just looking at the time. Um, Oh, my learned friend, I wasn't going to be as long as him. I'm sorry. It's all my fault. No, it's all right. We've asked you a lot of questions. So uh, that's... Well, well, the first point, and of course it's, it's double-edged, is um, um, she, she was uh, transparently honest. If she uh, can't, couldn't remember something that happened six years ago, uh, she said, I can't remember it. But... Um, what, what she was adamant about is uh, that she uh, wouldn't have made um, a note um, th that contained un untrue statements. Uh, I suspect I'm going to be challenged by my Lord Lord Justice Lewis. Well, she had some inaccuracies in it on the timings, but um, the, the, the statements um, that she made... Um, she was adamant were accurate. Uh, and, and my Lord, um, in my respectful submission, the judge's finding that the note was made on the 1st of January cannot be successfully challenged. I, if you were doing it at the time, how can you say I called at 3.15 when you could not have done, and you were writing that, prior to, if uh, you rely on this metadata, prior to, I'm not going to read it, 350, whatever it was. 338. 338. Yes. Huh. Well, my Lord, I... And 330, you're saying they uh, inform me. So he has to have seen it happening at 330, found wherever she was, Miss Dunbarwin, reported it, and she incorporates it into this note. How, how's that achievable? Well, my lord, the timings are obviously wrong. No, I'm, I know, but how, how, how can a judge say there's a wealth of circumstantial detail to show that it's genuine and not refer to this at all? Does he? He, he doesn't, and in fact, um, to take the point against me, he, he does... Um, if, if you go to... I mean, I'm just saying, if you, just thinking, you know, you see the well-informed person. The yes. well-informed person says, somebody's at their computer typing at the very moment that is supposed to be happening, something that cannot be happening. 
Yes, that surely raises a question mark about the reliability of the document, particularly because it's said to have been completed all at the same time. Yes, that's true. Um, my Lord, if you go to 177 in the transcript. Yes. Because you're asking me uh, what, how the judge came to write. Yes, yes. Um, after the judgment, uh, 177. Yes, sorry, yes, got there. Um, Thank you. After the judgment, of course, I was concerned about costs and Mr. Willem was concerned about the judgment. And, yes. Uh, uh, he pressed the judge and um, uh, perhaps. Um, At the foot of 176. I'll deal with the second point. Sorry, 176. Yes, sorry. Yep. Um, sorry. I'll deal with the second point first. Yes. As I make clear in my judgment, I consider Mrs. D D Bobbin's recollection of the events yes. of 1st of January is unreliable. So yes. um, it's not the judge looking through rose coloured glasses who says, well, this is a wonderful witness. And I'm no, I understand that. So he's treating her evidence with caution. Um, and Mr. Williams thinks that. Uh, in in, in fact, the judge is thinking Mrs. Dunbobbin is reliable, and um, uh, the judge says, no, I meant what I, s I said, I think. Let me read out what I said. When Mrs. Dunbobbin was cross-examined, I formed the conclusion she had no reliable recollection of the events of the 1st of January 2017, but I accepted that her evidence that she had made a note, um, that's the notes at 243, uh, on the 1st of January for the reasons I gave in my judgment. I've already accepted the submission. Her evidence about what actually happened on the 1st of January was unreliable, save yes. at the point she made a contemporaneous note. Yes. Uh, and, um, well, well, my lord, you're ahead of me, I'm sure. You, you to the end. To the end, Internal yes. consistency. Yes. Metadata. Yes. And doesn't accept that she was written as something which was untrue. Yeah. And, and so... So that... that Either the judge didn't think the penrith timing was right, because he yes. doesn't say, or that's not easy to understand. Um, well, what's e what is easy to understand is that uh, he accepted that the note was made on the 1st of January. Yes. Uh, and um, that was one submission I was making. Yeah. It would be difficult for this court to say that that was a conclusion he, he couldn't properly have reached. Um, the, the question then is what weight he gives to it and whether it's appropriate, or to use my learned friend's word, fair, um, to well, then rely upon that to yes. characterise Dr. Clements uh, as um, uh, having questions over her honesty or credibility. Uh, but, my lord, he's, he's not just relying on the note. He, he's relying on the way that Dr. Clements dealt with um, the cross-examination about the various accounts. And he's relying upon the various accounts themselves. And um, okay, so accuracy that, about time. Yes. Um, so I can just yes. interrupt. So what he re relied on was the note, what we're calling the note, the time note. Yes. He relied on his analysis of or his assessment of Dr. Clemens's evidence. And, and is there anything else? Um, well, only in the, the balancing exercise that a court does of having one witness in effect on each side to weigh. And the penundrum. Penundrum. Yeah, and, and, and weighing Lord Hoffman um, them in the balance. Yes. I, I mean, there's, there's but I'm just looking at the judgment, so I'm just trying, sorry to take you back to the beginning again, yes. just trying to analyse it. What led to his conclusion? Uh, um, and it's really the note and his assessment of Dr. Nemesis' evidence. I think, unless there's anything else you want to. Well, uh, and um, he says in paragraph 18, her demeanour. Now, demeanour in the abstract. Um, Court of Appeal has said we many times. Yes. Is, You're not going to raise Lord Leggett. 
<laughs> yes. uh, but um, he is absolutely entitled um, to look at demeanour. Um, that's why I meant her evidence. That's all. General that's sense. all yes. within her his assessment of Dr. Clemency's evidence. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, my lord, uh, Mr. Willems makes um, a number of points that I, I think I have conceded as to where the judge made errors in his record of the evidence. Um, but when one stands back, uh, one sees um, that uh, he is impressed by Mrs. Dunbobbin. He accepts that she made the note uh, on the 1st of January. Uh, sorry, the note dated the 1st of January on the 1st of January. And um, he accepts that she wouldn't have said, this is what um, Dr. Clements said to me, if Dr. <coughs> Clements hadn't said it. Can I pick you up on that? I'm sorry to, I know you're trying to wrap up. Yes. But he having, he found that she has no independent recollection. Yes. Did she give any evidence about who the us was in line three or to whom the information was given in the next shorter paragraph? So in the, in the line three of the first thing, yes. when it explained um, what had happened, she informed us that she had slipped on the steps. You seem to be clear, you're asking if she gave any explanation in her oral evidence? Yes, as to who yes. us was. Um, no, because she and, couldn't recall. And similarly, in the next paragraph, I met the couple in the carriage and escorted them to the local stair lo lower staircase. She, d she doesn't really discriminate between commas and full stops, as I, as I read mm. her. So let's not worry too much about that. When asked how the accident happened, she said she had worn the white bedroom slippers, blah, blah, blah. Was there any evidence to indicate that that had been said to Mrs. Dunbobbin? Yes. What? Because um. I, I, I need to make a note of it. If you can't find it immediately, perhaps we yes. could just, you're not going to go to judgment this evening, so perhaps you could just send us the references. Certainly. Um, spend a couple of minutes, we've got a bit of time. Um, of the evidence begins page 85 of the transcript. With the question at 31. This is cross-examination by, by Mr. S um, Williams. All right, later on in this statement you say, I met the couple in the corridor, escorted them to the lower staircase. When asked how the accident happened, she said she'd worn the white bedroom slippers and come out of the jacuzzi, put them on, walked down the steps and slipped. And then she says, yes, I walked her to the staircase. The bottom of the staircase is the one that's in the hotel. So it was through the corridors around the hotel. And Mrs. Clements was staying on the top floor. So I escorted her, went with her to the bottom of the staircase. So then she proceeded up to her bedroom. When did that take place? That would have been after the event. I'm sorry. Um, um, and then at 14, sorry, my apologies, that would have been, I met her in the corridor outside the spa when she was leaving the spa to go back to her bedroom and I escorted her from there, walked down the corridor, we've been through the hotel to the lower staircase and passed. And then 
there's a conversation about the chair and um, at 25 it would have been when she was coming out if she was coming out at Spark it would have been not long after she'd come out at Spark it certainly wouldn't have been an hour I'd walk to the bedroom um, and then uh, did you call the room and ask if she was okay when did you write this all on the same day um, you see you ask the question at the bottom of page 85 you give her the compendium it's not me asking the this question it's, it's Mr Willem asking All right, Mr Willem. Yeah. so she didn't say anything in answer to you in, in, well she may have done but it, um, so Mr Williams asks 31, 32, 33, 34 on bottom of 85 and her answer doesn't give anything about the source of the information um, well my, my lord by implication if you look at the answer she's walking with her and, and if you read the note that, that is, that would be the natural re reading. I, I would respectfully submit that uh, um, she was escorting them to the lower staircase, and when asked how the accident happened, she said she'd worn the slippers and put them on. It's not what is written. I met the couple in the corridor and escorted them to the lower staircase. Comma. When asked how the accident happened, she said. I'm sorry to be picky, yeah. but this is a, a serious claim <coughs> which needs to be thoroughly investigated. And at the moment, I take your point about possible implication of what's saying in the note, but the first paragraph informed us does not suggest it's Mrs. Dunbobbin. And to my eyes, the structure of the next sentence no, next paragraph, I met the couple in the corridor. There's not necessarily, or even, well, th at the moment, my provisional view is doesn't necessarily indicate that this is something that she said to Mrs. Dunbobby. Um, my Lord, if I may accept your invitation to just go through and, and yes. sort of the point I had in mind. I mean, it would be most unfortunate. I, I can see how this could be material. I sincerely hope it won't be the determinative factor. One way or the other. One way yes, I, I will uh, send a note by your clerk um, in the next 24 hours. If that's Thank you. If that's convenient. Um, my Lord, I, I did start, well, in, in answer to a question from um, Lord Justice Stuart Smith um, about where do we go from here? Is it a, um, if, if you were to make findings um, contrary to my submissions uh, and uh, whilst uh, we maintain um, that this is appeal, an appeal that should be dismissed uh, if you found um, merit in the criticisms um, that have been made uh, in, in my respectful submission uh, it would be a step too far for this court to reverse the findings that were made about the um, credibility of the witnesses and to find an alternative mechanism for the fall and it is something that would have to be explored again see how the yes. judgment um, the judgments uh, develop but, it, but we, I think we need your submissions in, on principle and you've done it, you've given your submission that effectively if we allow the appeal on uh, ground one uh, that you sh say that um, 
there should be a rehearing. If we allow the appeal on ground two, what then? I again say that there should be a rehearing because the alternative of you finding um, that the fool was over the edge would involve you, um, in the unusual circumstances of this case, uh, rejecting the trial judge's findings about the honesty and credibility of a witness, or two witnesses in effect, uh, and Okay, so both ground of one and two. With your own findings, yes. and then we say that it, Thank you. it's really a matter for a, a trial judge to determine those issues. Uh, can I just say, we've also been given the, uh, assume it's a copy of a consent, there's, there's a copy of a consent order that was made in November 2022, 20, which provides that the parties are to uh, file a case summary outlining the nature of the claim. I assume that's the order that led to yes. that document. Yeah. Uh, I think my learned friend mentioned it this morning and then his instructions are going to off. And yes. That's the, um, um, I don't know if it's prescribed anywhere, but that is the standard yep. form that one sees in these cases. Any other questions? No. no. Anything else? Um, well, are you happy to take from, from me what's in the um, disclosure statement, uh, or do you want to have copies of you mean about the, the, the list of documents? The, the name, the title of the document. Yes. Uh, should, should we see whether there's any uh, response to that? Um, I, I think, I mean, if you want to send us the document, by all means. Send well, us the document. I, I wouldn't have thought it's an issue, actually. No, so, yes, thank you. Yes, Mr. Williams. Yes, my lord, dealing with that point directly, the mm. disclosure doc list I've seen, it does attribute the typed document to Mr. Bobbin. It's dated on the date of the document said to be 1st of January 2017. But of course, that is the date on the document. That's, that's but that's, it, it gives that title to, that um, Mr. Block uh, read to us. It's and it tricky. has in the column, uh, and is the column date of document? Or is it just date? It's date of document. It is date but, of document. But the date of the document, of course, is on the edit. First I, I, I understand that, yeah. But it is attributed. To Miss Dunbobbin. Yes. In fairness, that is correct. Yes. The only time it's brought into evidence, it's not referred to in the in Mr. No. Dunbobbin's statement, yes. is in chief. Yes. And one has to wonder why, if it's available in the documents, and she exhibits five things to her witness statement, why she doesn't include it. Well, my, and my recollection in evidence was, was that she hadn't read it before today. Yes. Is what she said. Yes. yes. So if that's correct, my lord then how do those who instruct Mr. Block know it's attributed to her? I don't get it. It's it. If she has I don't know, I know. They must have got it from, assuming they got it from the defendant. They put it in the disclosure list yes. as being her document, because presumably someone tells them that that's the case. Well, presumably. Anyway, it's not challenged. It goes in as her document. It goes in as her document. And it must have been in the bundle. It was in the bundle. It was in the bundle. It was page six of the bundle. And Mr. Mr. Block covered his faces by taking her to it to say, what is this? Indeed. OK, thank you. Yes. Wholly different issue as to whether it's reliable. Briefly, going briefly through the points. Yes. Um, my learned friend offered a suggestion as to how we would describe the, le the, the, the area of the jacuzzi which is the top of the steps, but is not the raised deck. Yes. This is a 164 in response to the judge's question. Sorry, 164 of the... Of the supplemental bundle. Okay, it's part of the submission. You yes. we were taken to 163 by my little friend. Yes. 164, Mr. Block, in response to Judge Sefton. I will try and use that term. So Sorry, which? Just no. over the page. You, before 163, Mr. Block said, between oh, yes. which is on the raised yes. edge, Judge says, well, I'm going to refer it to it as the raised, raised edge as the deck, the right hand deck. And then over the page, then we all understand one another, Judge Sefton says. And Mr. Block says, I will try and use that terminology. When we've then got an area, the area between the step and the raised deck, 
which I'm not sure what we can call what we can call that the lower deck perhaps it's a small point but it, it reinforces the main point I've been making in relation to um, the going back to the principle I was trying to submit upon which is that we were focusing on mechanism not location hence the importance of the agreed fact being one of location which was no longer part of the judge's decision making Lord Justice Stuart Smith asked whether or not there is an authority we can find in relation to agreed facts um, or the, any application to resolve from an agreed fact having spent some time over lunch looking more closely at part 14 it appears, as your Lordship indicated, that it felt that it should. It appears that part CPR 14, dealing with admissions, covers this area. I can take you to 14.1. In the current white book, that's page 450, but 14.1 of the CPR. did refer to this very briefly before, but yes. looking at the wording, a party may admit the truth of the whole or any part of another party's case. So it's not just admissions on liability. 14.1 brackets 1.2, the party may do this by giving notice in writing, such as in a statement of case or by letter. So there's no formal mechanism for this. And subparagraph 5, the permission of the court is required to amend or withdraw admission. So my lords, it's, it's a matter for this court as to whether or not what was an, the agreed fact is essentially an admission part of the claimant's case. But do you think about that? Is a case summary really giving notice in writing? And since you've got one uh, practice direction specifically dealing with case summaries, does that not indicate that that's where it's dealt with rather than uh, part BTR 40.1. There doesn't appear to be a separate rule to deal with this particular point, I but we would submit that it does fall, my lord, within 14.1 because it's the admission of part of the claimant's case. And a case summary is the giving of notice in writing? Well, the, the giving of notice, my lord, would be someone attempting to resolve an agreement. No, the party may admit the truth of the whole written part. The party may do this by giving notice in writing. Yes. You've got to give notice in writing of the admission. So the agreed case summary is a joint document. Yeah. It, that's that's notice between the two that there is an agreement. That's contractual is not a word, but there is an agreement <coughs> as to the fact between the two parties. Right. Yes. And the practice direction is to be found 14 PD1, and that that deals with 14 PD7 with withdrawing an admission. And it just repeats the point that admissions under Part 14 may be withdrawn with the court's permission. Yes. We can't find an authority that deals with trying to resolve from an agreed fact. And this blends into what my Lord, Lord Justice Stuart Smith was asking Mr. Block about when he was inviting Mr. Block to be unkind, if necessary, to me. And the suggestion that potentially there is a waiver. And if we were dealing with admissions under 14, it's not possible to simply waive such a, a matter. It would be, it would need to be withdrawn with the court's permission. And I would submit it would in fact be quite a remarkable proposition that during a trial, by simply not shouting out loudly, hold on, there's an agreed fact, that amounts to a waiver stopping the party from relying upon the I refer back to what Lord Justice uh, Lewis said. Essentially, we are bound by it because the judge is bound by it. Going back to the introduction of the typed document, my own friend introduced it at line 53. So, page 53, I beg your pardon, of the transcript lines 8 and 9 with the words that was created pretty contemporaneously. 
Okay. Okay. So it was created pretty contemporaneously. And it was only when Miss Dunbobbin gave evidence that it was asserted it was created on the first. And again, a minor point on this. One other issue which we put in our written submission, but did not, I've not articulated this morning. Miss Dunbobbin wrote on the back of the accident report form. But she, in her own handwriting, But she does not record at 242 anything about the steps. And the question that we ask in our written document is why is she writing, and she admits she wrote this in two different places, two different times, of the handwritten note on the back of the accident report form? Why is it on the same day she writing something typed? on a computer and in handwriting on the accident report form. Again, a question as to is the type document actually correctly identified as being dated? It refers to the 1st of January, but is it actually dated 1st of January? In relation to balancing the evidence, we, we repeat the submission and your lordships are are aware of our position that not referring to Mr. Siddle is a serious misdirection on the basis of the evidence before the court. My learned friend was on a separate issue. My learned friend was going through a list of accounts that Dr. Clements gave, inc incorrectly related to an account given to, Dor to Corey Bainbridge. We know from page 104 of the transcript. One for all of the bundle that Corrie Bainbridge accepted she did not get an account from Dr. Clements. Another point put in our submissions, and one that was not considered by the court below, was if it is correct that she fell down the steps. How is it that she landed on the step on the left side of her, of her abdomen? There are only three steps. My well, lords, in relation to the question, where do we go from here? Um, it would be sensible to await your Lordship's judgments, of course, but preliminary, our preliminary position would be if you were to find, find for us in relation to point one, the agreed fact, the judge has given us the answer. Because he would be bound by the agreement that she fell over the ledge and that was a breach of duty. And he did not make any findings of contributory negligence. If it was ground two, our preliminary view, my lords, would be that you will have to find that the judge is plainly wrong to have disregarded claimant's evidence, supported by Mr. Siddle, and use the typed account, the metadata supporting the typed account, to supersede what the claimant said. And on that basis, my lords, she, the only alternative would be she fell off over the ledge. So we go back to the same point, that the, the answer would be there was a breach of duty as found by the court below. And again, no contributory negligence was found against Dr. Clements. So we wouldn't automatically agree with the suggestion that this matter needs to be revisited at a trial of this particular issue. My lords, I've, because of the time of day, I have gone very quickly through those yes, reply no. points. Is there anything that I need to e no. expand upon? I don't think so. No, great. No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, respective legal teams, for the very comprehensive written and oral submissions. We will reserve our judgments. They will be provided to you in due course in draft for the usual purposes. And you can explain to everybody what that means. It can't be used for other purposes.
practices just other than correcting our grammar. And as uh, we've discussed, once you've received uh, the draft judgment, we will deal with any outstanding matters 